Let's get into tax. Uh, I love this one. Everybody will say government is the worst enemy. Tilu need a friend. I know it's a, it's a different one. It's a government is the worst enemy. Everybody will beat down government. Tilu need a friend. And now the question, you know, remember, it's, everything is unfair. Question is, it's an open book test. I always say it's open book test. Whoever studies more gets to understand what, what does the book say. And you apply the rules for you because we studied more. You should get extra benefit out of it. So government has done a lot of things for us that we could use and make government our friend. And if the government becomes our friend, we got the best process and system and they want the biggest powerful thing working for us. So that's the way I take a look at it. And so in this case, I thought the best way will be we'll do a simulation of a case study. And this is month number seven, no, almost about eight. We have four months left. Most of us, we know what your earning of this year look like. And then we'll ask the question, is there anything we can do to optimize the tax, right? Or my taxable income. All right, so, so that, was, that was my thought, the things we're gonna cover. Example of taxable income for family, framework of a tax optimization, then live case study. I have Bill with me today, one and two I'll cover, and the third one is out there. Full disclaimer, hey, don't write off everything. Please don't. So some folks wanna write off everything, so just be careful, talk to your CPA, accountant, and get some counseling before you start writing out. I thought that was kind of fun when I when I took a look at it. My wife gets freaked out every time I talk about can we go out for dinner? You and I, it's a two business partners. She was like, Are you gonna write that off? I was like, hey, you know, so that's out there. All right. All right, let's go, let's go take a look at it. Uh, again, this is purely fictitious numbers and it's for educational purposes only. I messed with the number as much as I could. And thank you, Bill, for finding an error in the calculation, but I will move forward with that error. So whole idea is that when you do your taxes, at the end of the day, when you submit it, you get a one page document. I forgot that's the first page of tax that gets you two years of income. So I, I took that model and I said, hey, we have a couple married file, uh, filing jointly on top and their tax bracket was 24% in year 2020 and 35% uh, in year 2021. The income, was $140,000, went down a little bit to 125. The other income doubled almost, went from a 3, 337, that's a 237 to 450 almost. I'm, I'm rounding it up. So in a sense, in a year to year basis, they went up from a $300,000 of dual income and to almost $600,000 of dual income, right? So just income, they worked hard to a point the business income went up and their salary stayed. Probably one person owns a business, the other person uh, works at a corporate job, probably the salary plus a bonus, whatever happened, right? That's the simulation. So they adjusted gross income was 300 to almost 600. So they, they had an increase of 186% of income. Before I get to the middle of it, I'll look at the bottom. So they have done something uh, there, here, you can take a look at it. They have a deduction, state standard, but here they had a qualified deduction and they had no deduction on 2021. So year to year, the deduction went down, right? So then look at the taxable income. So they made 300 gross level, went up to 186%. So their tax burden went up almost three times. So look at the very bottom. They made 305, but they kept 300. Because of the deduction, the way they set it up, they paid only $5,000 tax. On the other side, the year after, they worked more. They worked harder. They doubled the income almost, but they took out only 423. So even though their gross level income went up to 186, uh, 86%, they took home 141% increase. So the point is sometimes working hard is great. And then you gotta be work smart as well. And that's why you need people like Bill uh, to make sure that they, they give you the advice, right? So uh, we always say, uh, my, my mentor used to say, or he she says it first you make it, then you pay the bill, and you feel bad and you cry about it. So then you go back and again, optimize that, right? So the question is in 2022, if the family were to go back, um, do a planning or we are in 2023, our projection looks like we'll be making a certain amount of money. My question is what can we do now? What else we can do given our earning, it's almost you know, there. What else can we do in the deduction level that could potentially put us in a path or I will be paying tax, but at, at a later time, not today. So on that note, everybody pays tax. 
our goal is not to pay tax today. We'll defer the tax. So whatever, you know, tax avoidance, I don't want to pay tax, tax maker zero, that's not true. Everybody pays tax. And it's like, a, you just don't want to pay today. That's the whole idea. I'll, I'll kick the can as long as I can. If you ask Bill, he'll be like, Till after you die, you pay the tax. And I was like, I don't want to die. I don't want to think about it. I know it's going to happen one day, but I just want to defer the tax for now, right? So that's, so that's the idea. And we'll do a simulation where Bill is going to come back and say, hey, if this earning looks like those are three or four or five things you can do to optimize your an earning in the next four months as you go through. All right. So uh, th those are the framework on the left-hand side. Uh, there are other frameworks as well, but most of the things that we understand that fits into those buckets. Uh, possible strategy, and the first one is reduce the taxable income. That means you increase the uh, tax deductions, or if you cannot increase it, at least you maximize it, the tax credits. And then you can also time the income and deduction, or you can restructure the whole investment for your tax efficiency, right? Then, so there are some levers. It's not, it's not hard and set right away, right? Uh, so all in all, it's going to boil down to you improving your tax knowledge, and you working with the tax professionals, right? So our idea here is not to solve, rather give you a thought, or at least a framework, how you can get to number six and seven, right? So our, our, our objective is to start the number six with you guys, then you should take the number six, get to the number seven, so you can position your you know, P&L, of your family P&L, to have a lower taxable income, right? So that's, that's there. So on that note, uh, I would like to introduce Bill. Bill knows everything about everybody, uh, including massive team, <laughs> A to Z. So he's our top secret guy. Uh, we've been with Bill forever. I don't know Bill for how long. Uh, so our goal is to, hey, um, you know, Bill, let's take a look at that existing, you know, the p &L that we have. And since we're real estate, we'll take a look two different ways, right? We'll use real time case study. One case study is the Horizon deal that Trevor was mentioning. Second one is, the, um, the Harris Rich, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Austin deal, the Harris Rich, we, we're going to use them. So I'm an investor. I got Bill on my side. I have two deals in front of me. I want to do something with the real estate. And options that I have is this. I have, a, I have two investments on hand with or without cost segregation. And the question is, what do I do? Do I do both? Do I do one? And do I do none? Or what do I do now so that I can minimize my taxable income and pay the tax years from now, right? On that note, Bill, would you mind dissecting this one in the light of those two, uh, you know, cost sex and no cost sex and new development versus existing multifamily and yeah. spinning your way as well, please. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. So, hey, good evening, everybody. So I'm Bill Pilkington. And so what we have here often is like an, an opportunity it's usually best, especially now. So even though we're, you know, almost end of July, beginning of August, it becomes a good opportunity to kind of look to see what's going forward for the rest of the year. Kind of, kind of see like, you know, what, what else is in your pipeline? And because if you come to somebody like in February, March, sometimes it's too late. The best thing we can do is make an appointment to talk about the current year. But say you've got a good idea of where you've gone for the current year. So kind of looking at these two situations here, uh, so one of the best things you've got going is it's married, which means when you're married, one spouse might be the primary earner, which allows the other spouse to become a real estate professional. Now, real estate professional is not, does not mean just you become a realtor or you're in construction. Sometimes it does mean active management. It means sometimes like being a landlord. But what real estate allows you to do is to front load a lot of your losses. Now, for those that are real estate professionals, they get to take those deductions in the current year. So you're offsetting your current year income, thereby reducing your current year tax. Now, that does if you're a passive, you've actually still got a lot of tax advantages. What happens in your tax advantages you're seeing here like these numbers, but what these numbers don't represent is cash flow in the sense of what gets distributed from these passive investments. These earnings, when we talk about net tax cash flow, that's talking about gross earnings. Nice thing about a lot of the real estate, we front load your deductions 
So then when it starts paying out income, until you recover all of your losses, which for all intents and purposes are paper losses, it's depreciation, you're not paying any tax. And so what that means is you'll really start to see a lot of the advantages from the real estate on the sale. So for some people, it may mean as you buy, you may not be able to save taxes up front immediately, but you're setting yourself up for future benefits. Now, what I like to say too is if you've got more, you've got say five different investments, you start to benefit from the ability of like where you had those other ones, like Char was talking about cost seg, no cost seg, because if you've got built up losses, you can now start to evaluate deals like, okay, what type of internal rate of return am I looking at? You, you may or may not even need the cost segregation. Some of those that are early on, or maybe they had a big sale, they had a big gain, they're looking at those things there. Everybody's situation is slightly different. But what you're looking at is taking deductions up front and holding those deductions behind glass. And that glass says, break in case of profits. So what happens is year one or year zero, whatever you want to call it from, you, you, you get a large loss. And then you start drawing down from that loss. And even though you're getting paid cash flow, you're, you're using the leverage of the depreciation on the property to not pay any tax. And then when that property does sell, and if you buy another one within the same calendar year, you're able to keep kicking the tax can down the road. Because the IRS allows the, the real estate to accelerate the depreciation. It's kind of another way of saying, like, imagine if you had a big log and you put that log on a fire and that fire might take 27 years to burn. Or you can cut that log in half and then chop it up into smaller pieces. And so you're still the same log, but now you're able to burn off a lot more of that log in the first one to five years. So you've got this building, but instead of waiting 27 years for your deductions, you start front loading a lot of your deductions. Well, those deductions give you for tax purposes, a loss, we'll call it a paper loss, which means until you get paid back for all your losses and gains, the IRS is not charging you any tax. So you're able to start getting distributions, able to start getting cash flow without an increase in tax. It's kind of one of those, it's almost like, doesn't even show up on the tax return. There are some places it shows up, but it's not one of those income. So you're not paying tax on it. It's a little bit of like, okay, you see this, like what you see here, but what we don't always see is, well, what about the cash flow? What about the distributions I'm getting? How much tax am I paying on them? And that's where we talk about in the current year, as you receive them, zero. Now, zero is not the same thing as tax-free. You do want to always keep in mind, again, it's we call it like defer, 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 die. And so, sorry, I mean, Shara and I like to joke around about that, but last time I checked, except for Jesus, one out of every one people dies, you know, so I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and so I know I'm going to die. We'll just use me as an example. So my wife's going to be fine because like me, myself, I'm also invested in a lot of the multifamily properties uh, across different states. And so what happens, we're getting the cash flow. We invested up front. We, and I'm not the real estate professional. So Sometimes people think they need to go for that. There's a lot of benefits, even just from being a passive. Again, it's one of those, you put your money in, you start getting paid distributions, you start getting cash flow. it sells, you have a large gain, but you reinvest it in more properties, you actually probably increase your cash flow. And again, you still keep deferring the tax. And it's, so it's kind of like gross almost equals net. Now, in the event you decide, you know what, hey, this has been fun, let me just cash everything out there is going to be a big tax bill at the end, but that's, you know, again, one of those, you can plan for it if you plan in advance. I know that was me just kind of like doing a lot of talking. Sometimes people have specific questions. You know, we can talk in generalities too. I'm happy to give anybody an answer here. I just don't know if you want to, you know, in front of everybody else go, yeah, I make $175,000 a year. I want to invest. You know? <laughs> so let's ask this way, right? Let's say me and my wife, right? I'll go back five years from now. Uh, before. So both of us, we worked, uh, you know, W-2s and we wanted to invest in real estate and I want to get some benefit of depreciation. So even though I don't realize 
the entirety of the, I cannot front load my depreciation. What else? Is it, is there any benefit of, can I bank them for future terms or how, how would that work if I'm working and I'm not a real estate professional? What yes. do I do with the depreciation? So what it is, it, you never lose it. It ends up, you, you bank the losses to offset your future income. Like, like, so here's a really good example. Imagine you're in five different properties and they're carrying a $20,000 loss each. So collectively you have 100,000 losses. And then one of them sells and you have a 60,000, so six zero, sixty thousand $60,000 gain. Well, you think it's 20, 20, 20. You would think, hey, I may have to pay tax on that because I was carrying a 20,000 loss on this property. And I just sold this property for a 60,000 gain. Most people might think, hey, I got to pay tax on $40,000. But with real estate, you actually get to pool them all together and go, wait a minute, I still had another 80,000 of losses over here. I'm going to use 40,000 of losses from my other real estate properties to offset my current gain. And so it becomes a time value of money. You could walk away with the gain and you know go spend it on personal and you're fine, or you reinvest it in another property and now your other 80 of losses that went to 40, you start to create new losses for yourself. And again, defer, 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 die. Now, okay. that's if you so, only focus on the real estate. Sometimes also we do the tax planning, like, like going back to the scenario of what you had, where we see like the things like, okay, hey, we lost the qualified business income deduction. Well, maybe we look at that Schedule C and convert that over to an S corporation. And we start paying payroll. And then maybe even what we do is like, you now start saying, hey, you know what? Not only do I want to take payroll, I'm going to create like a 401k account and I'm going to use my 401k to invest in the real estate. There's different opportunities based on the individual situation. This one in particular had good self-employed income that you could use things like that. But maybe one of the people in this situation is like, hey, you know, what would it look like if I, I didn't even, you know, I dropped my W-2 income, become a full-time real estate person managing properties that now all of a sudden there's cases sometimes tax goes you know close to zero. It goes close to zero this year. Again, we're deferring it till later. But in the meantime, now you've got advantage of your money now. You're taking your cost segregation depreciation now, investing in other properties, and you're really just setting yourself up, for lack of a better term, for an early retirement. A good retirement, oh, cool. not the permanent retirement of the die die. <laughs> you know, this is a good retirement. <laughs> so let me kind of recap, right? So let's say, you know, going back uh, every year, every year we invested one deal, year number five. I have you know, carried over $100,000 worth of, you know, your your total loss, right? And then the first investment came back with a profit, $50,000. So I have $100,000 worth of loss and $50,000 worth of gain. I still have a net of negative fifty thousand dollar and on gain, right? Is that is that right? And then that means I'm kind of deferring the tax, even though I had a gain, I'm not paying the tax. It's offsetting my stuff. So it's just timing the income and deduction, right? Is that the way? That's accurate because you have to until you recover all of your losses. Now, I'll make one qualification. I am talking about at the IRS level. If we get down into individual states. It's the same thing, but you need to zoom in with Google like, hey, Texas sometimes thinks it's the only place in the world, but, you know, so Texas doesn't have the state income tax, so you don't have to worry about that. But say you've invested, like, I've got some in North Carolina, some in Georgia, some in Oklahoma. If those states have a profit at the state level, I'm not offsetting my, tax, my taxes. But at the national level, at the IRS level, I'm using the losses from one to offset the gains from the other. Now, same same scenario where one person has a W two, other one is a real estate professional, and they have a hundred thousand dollars worth of loss or fifty thousand dollars worth of gain. So what really would happen? They'll get the benefit two ways, right? One benefit is that there's no gain because I'm still a net loss, and then if they could realize the whole fifty grand, I'm thinking right here, if I'm a thirty five percent tax bracket, yeah. I take a fifty grand worth of deduction, I'm at a twenty four percent tax bracket. Correct. All of a sudden, I gain another ten percent, right? 